Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Passenger Terminal Safety. Thousands of slip, trip, and fall accidents occur each month in places where the traveling public interfaces with transportation services, land, sea, and air. This includes airports, bus terminals, cruise ships, and ferry terminals, railroad terminals, and train and subway stations. This program will cover a variety of safety issues related to walking surfaces, including ramps, stairs, pathways, waiting areas and platforms, as well as transporting equipment such as escalators, elevators, and moving walkways, which are commonly present in these facilities. In addition, available standards and safety requirements will be discussed. The presenters for today's program are Dr. Carl Berkowitz and Dr. Oren Masery. Dr. Berkowitz has 48 years of transportation traffic engineering experience. He has served as a litigation consultant and held various positions in industry, government, and higher education with extensive experience in planning, design, safety, security, construction, maintenance, operations, and management. He holds a BCE in civil engineering and an MBA in industrial management from the City College of New York, and an MS in transportation planning and a PhD in transportation planning and engineering from NYU Poly. In addition to his work involving pedestrians in virtually every form of transportation and its safety, including aviation and maritime, Dr. Berkowitz has written numerous reports and articles for major publications, chaired task forces, appeared on national television and radio, and made numerous scholarly presentations worldwide. He holds memberships in many transportation professional associations. Dr. Berkowitz's areas of expertise include accident studies, slips, trips, and falls, pedestrian accidents, pedestrian perception reaction capabilities, subway and commuter rail accidents, speed and distance analysis, and railroad grade. Dr. Orrin Masery holds a BS, MS, and PhD in mechanical engineering from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. Currently, he is a professor in the Department of Ocean and Mechanical Engineering at Florida Atlantic University, located in Boca Raton, Florida. He has over 30 years of mechanical engineering experience. He has served as a litigation and engineering consultant and held positions in industry as well. His research interests include robotics, automation, machine tools, controls, assistive technology, and accident reconstruction. Warren is an expert on vehicular accident reconstruction, low-speed rear-end collisions, slips, trips, and falls, pedestrian accidents, machinery, chronic liability, building and safety codes, and speed and distance analysis. Warren has written numerous reports and articles for major publications on the above topics. He holds memberships in both ASTM and SAE. The presenters have asked to take questions throughout today's presentation. If you have a question, please use the chat feature found on the right-hand side of the screen or the Q&A feature found below it to submit your questions. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of this webinar as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation used during today's program. We do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program, I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the presentation over to, to our distinguished presenters, Carl and Oren. Carl, the presentation is uh, is now yours. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, uh, just for the, uh, the participants, we're going to be uh, passing the presentation back and forth as we go along, and we hope everybody enjoys uh, what we're about to present. Uh, just as an introduction, it's, uh, I, I don't think uh, we really have to dwell on this too long, but that w when we enter a passenger facility, we expect that we're going to be safe and that everything uh, that is part of the infrastructure of that facility is going to provide us with a safe passage through that facility. But unfortunately, that isn't what happens, and we find that there are sometimes unexpected changes in the infrastructure of, of a passenger terminal, such things as uh, holes and uneven surfaces, 
poor coefficient of friction on terms of the floors of the property, uh, the speed sometimes at a moving walk or or other other moving facilities might have, uh, have such as an escalator, and any of these sudden changes uh, when they take place and they're not obvious to us, uh, this can create what we call a hazard. And we're going to talk today about some of the numerous hazards that exist in a passenger terminal. Let's take a look at this from a, an historical perspective. And I guess uh, we all are familiar with uh, Chinese ancient proverbs, and this one uh, really fits this presentation to a T. And this is, who trips and falls should not blame his foot. Uh, uh, the blame, uh, as this proverb points out, belongs to others. And, this, and the concerns over slip, trips, and falls has been a concern of humanity for thousands of years. In fact, the first reported slip, trips, and falls uh, go back as far as our oral written history. And uh, it's interesting to note that Leonardo da Vinci uh, had his finger in almost everything, and in 1495, he was the first to begin to understand the laws of friction and the causes of slip, trips, and falls. And on the slide, you could see his uh, basic machine, which is not too far different from the machines we use today some uh, 500 years later. Uh, the early writings, uh, well, this is stone writings, the Code of Hammurabi, uh, dealt with uh, the concerns of falling and how, you know, th those who build homes and, or facilities or infrastructure uh, need to be concerned about what could happen uh, by poorly designing their facility. Uh, the Bible, the traditional Bible, uh, 1300 BCE, uh, in several places, in Exodus, for example, talks about holes and what happens if somebody falls into a hole or an animal falls into a hole and what the responsibility of the property owner is uh, if there's a hole in their property. Uh, Leviticus, uh, still part of the traditional Bible, uh, deals with uh, a blind person and the need for us. Uh, this, I guess, was the first ADA uh, requirement uh, uh, for the blind and that we have to really deal with the deaf and the blind and make sure that they have a smooth passage as to wherever they are traveling. In Deuteronomy, they, uh, uh, the Bible took into consideration if you have a, a high place and that you have to protect people from falling off from that high place. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, we haven't uh, progressed as far as we should be progressing from those days, 1300 B.C. Slip trips and falls uh, in, the, in passenger terminals there's tens of thousands of them each year, and and each and each and every day there are, are thousands. And the cost of these trips, slips, and falls to the terminal operator is into the billions of dollars. The com basic components of a slip, trip, and fall are the the characteristics of the person involved, the activity they're taking place in, the environmental factors uh, that uh, uh, t take uh, to take into consideration the local temperature, the lighting, and the nature of the surface uh, that the uh, passenger is walking on in the uh, terminal. Uh, basically, if we were to uh, summarize in three short uh, terms, what are the causes of slip, trips, and falls? We can break it down to poor design, poor maintenance, and the result of the poor design and poor maintenance is the passenger losing their balance. And Basically, uh, this is changes in geometry, uh, changes in speed, things of that nature. We can categorize falls into uh, three general categories. Uh, one is circumstances, that is, uh, is the uh, fall on a level, on a slope, on steps, stairs, from heights. Uh, the age of the person, are they uh, young adults, or children, older persons, are they healthy, are they ill? Uh, what place does the accident take place? Is it in the terminal itself or in some parking area? These are all, uh, these are the three areas that we can basically categorize all types of falls. What are the factors in falls? Uh, changing gait, loss of balance, uh, individual stature, the strength of an individual, their vision, how they behave in a particular circumstance in, in terms of their uh, traveling through the terminal. 
these all can be factors in causing a fall. The environment in falling is very important. The uh, interface between our, uh, our shoe or boot and the ground interface, the presence of tripping hazards, that's obstacles, raised uh, areas or sunken areas along our pathway, the characteristics of the, of the floor surface and, and the friction generated between the, whatever we're wearing and the material that is used in the floor, the surface conditions, uh, is it wet, is it dry, is it contaminated, these all take, uh, you know, take into, are taken into consideration in terms of considering uh, the environment and falling. This is uh, an area that is of, of constant concern for people in the safety field. Uh, here on the bottom, I show you a couple of examples of people actually falling off, uh, off platforms. But this is a difficult situation where you have heights, and especially heights more than three or four feet. It's advisable to have some kind of guard along that raised area, uh, such as uh, balcony railings, uh, so that person's center of gravity uh, is not uh, forward of, of that area, but is, is held back by the, by the guard which we place on these areas where there is a change of height. This type of uh, injury is responsible for very serious injuries and, and, and sometimes and a lot of times in, in the death of the person that has fallen from the height. So uh, one of the things that we have to be concerned about is unguarded edges or openings to lower areas. In terms of uh, uh, railroad facilities, uh, this is very difficult. In other countries, they have built uh, such things as elevated doors and walls and other types of things to prevent these type of incidents from occurring. In Japan, particularly, uh, this is a uh, railroad is a common source of suicide. So in Japan, they build walls along the uh, platforms to prevent people from falling on or jumping onto the tracks. Falls, as I mentioned uh, before, some of the things that are taken into consideration in terms of falls, and that's the health of the uh, passenger. Are they fatigued? Are they on medication? Have they been drinking a little bit? Uh, what are the environmental conditions? Is it dry? Is it wet? What activity are they taking place in? Are they, are they acting in a normal manner? Or are they uh, partaking in horseplay? Things of that nature. Fall outcomes, falling on levels and falling from height. Uh, some of the outcomes are, of course, injuries uh, from on falling on a level. Usually the injuries are lower upper limb fractures, sprains, back or head injuries. Uh, in some cases, people are falling back on the back of their head and the bone in the rear of the head is protruded into the brain, causing hemorrhaging and ultimate death. Falling from heights, of course, is much more dangerous, and the force is generated, and the nature of the surface all play a very critical role in type of injuries, and many, many falls from height also result in death. How do you prevent these kinds of accidents? Basically, by removing the hazard in the first place, and also by providing information such as passive warning or active warning uh, to make people aware of whatever dangers are present in their environment. There are several engineering principles that come into play when we're dealing with uh, slip trips and falls, and the first and most paramount is understanding the hazard. If we understand the hazard, then we can deal with the hazard, and then we can eliminate the hazard through design or redesign or reconstruction. We can provide warnings of the hazard. And, and thus minimize the risk of the hazard. Uh, the, some of the areas we're going to be discussing today are the di different aspects of a terminal facility which interface with the passenger, and this is just a list of all the things that I'm sure you're quite aware of, but we're going to cover most of these uh, in our uh, presentation today. There are many standards uh, and, and codes that guide us in the designing and planning of passenger facilities and terminals, and this is uh, an example of some of those agencies. There are probably a few more that we might have missed, but this is the basic uh, uh, primary agencies that are involved in the standards uh, that are used in terms of passing uh, and walking and traveling through a passenger terminal. And one has to keep in mind that uh, standards don't cover all situations, and that standards are really a consensus uh, I serve on, on standards committees, as does 
the sets of mastery, and basically when we come up with a standard, it's a consensus and a majority vote of the members of that committee. So we sometimes have to compromise on what we would like to see in the standard so we can get enough agreement to get the standard approved. <clears throat> and this term is often heard, pedestrian best practices. <clears throat> in many cases, uh, there aren't exactly standards, but we can depend upon such things as the American Disabilities Act and the U.S. Access Board to give us guides in terms of what should be best practices in dealing with pedestrian safety. <coughs> Excuse me. The, <coughs> the pathways within a terminal environment are really critical, and uh, the elements in, in a safe design is to ensure that passengers can circulate throughout the system safely. Excuse me for the coughing. <coughs> a good design, uh, this is kind of a basic, uh, should be regularly aligned pathways, easy to understand layouts, and they provide orientation, orientation cues, and, and the pedestrians uh, of, of different types have different requirements. <coughs> Young people have different requirements from the elderly, and even the impaired and disabled have other requirements. And good design takes these all into consideration. And especially when we place non-visual information, it has to be considered that we have different types of individuals, and they may be uh, unfamiliar with be it the railroad environment or the airport environment or the bus environment, whatever environment that they happen to be traveling in. The primary uh, terminal areas, uh, when you go through a terminal, we have the, uh, the waiting rooms, floor areas, the travel floor areas, Ramps between areas, stairs between areas, escalators to help us change grade, elevators to do the same, <coughs> various pathways, and sometimes we have uh, gangways or jetways or loading bridges or passenger boarding bridges or passenger way walkways, those kinds of things. And always we want to do best practices to prevent an accident and removing the hazard in the first place because uh, most accidents if we uh, take into consideration the various hazards, uh, they can be prevented, and, and if management understands the dangers, they can act quickly to eliminate the hazards before they result in any kind of uh, dangerous situation for passengers. One of the important things uh, to take into consideration is pedestrian information needs, and I'm not going to go through this in too much detail right now. Uh, basically, the passenger information needs are... Uh, self-described in this uh, particular uh, uh, slide, and to keep in mind, there are really, really good standards out there, such as the manual uh, uniform tra traffic control devices, but information needs to be well understood and not confusing and helpful. The floor areas, uh, which is a good part of most terminals, uh, is where the passenger is always interacting between his footwear or her footwear and the floor material. And this, uh, the way the floor is taken care of can determine whether or not there's a potential of slip, trip, and fall. Most floor areas uh, present an acceptable slip risk when dry and, and, and if they're free of slippery substances. And in some cases where the floors are subject to wetting, they also design the materials that reduce that risk as well. Pathway for passengers is very important. And uh, you have to be careful what type of flooring material is used. Uh, the flooring selected should be one that should be safe. Uh, special floor cleaning equipment and scheduling should be enforced. And there should be regular maintenance and it should be free of instructions. And it's also important that there should be no tripping uh, hazards along the way. And generally, uh, it's, it's been established that any change in grade of more than a quarter of an inch can result in a, in a, in a tripping situation. And, of course, the coefficient of friction should be at least 0.5 and greater, and Dr. Nasser is going to talk about that more later. Uh, I see there's a question. Hey, Carl, we have a question here. Uh, can, can, can we uh, address it at this point? Sure, why not? Sure. We have a question from Amanda who asks, what about revolving door accidents at the airport? What, in what respect does she want to know about revolving They happen. Uh, sometimes uh, a person walking slowly, in front of another person will slow the door down, and the normal gait of the individual behind may cause a trip and a fall. Uh, sometimes the doors jam while they're turning. Sometimes people try to go in the opposite direction and 
impact the people that are going through the revolving door. But if she can give us more specific what she's looking at or looking for, maybe we can answer that question in more detail. Okay, excellent. I'll work on getting uh, some additional information from Amanda. I'd like to talk about that first element uh, in the terminal, and that's the uh, gangway. And uh, this is a, a ramp, or, you know, it's, it's a ramp that connects uh, a land area uh, to, a, to a, a transportation vehicle. This is primarily uh, used in, uh, in marine vessels such as ferries, uh, cruise ships, uh, sightseeing boats, and that, that nature. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, is not given enough attention because they, uh, they are an outdoor facility and they offer uh, lots of potential opportunities for people to be injured, uh, such as the gangway uh, separating from the vehicle while somebody is on it or uh, movement of the uh, vessel while somebody is on it and things like that. Uh, there are many, many standards uh, that go into the planning and designing and operation of gangways, and this slide shows you uh, from occupational uh, safety, OSHA, all the way through the military standards, uh, the MLIs, and also the professional societies. Uh, this uh, describes uh, those standards that are applicable to uh, designing and operating uh, gangways. Gangways uh, are a very important component and cannot be managed in a slipshod manner. They have to be uh, well designed, uh, well maintained, and carefully operated, and the individuals in the crew that operate the gangways have to be sure that they are properly engaged so that there is no danger of somebody using the gangway from slipping and falling. And there has been many cases of people even falling off uh, gangways. And uh, even though it's unfortunate, they, it's fortunate that when they fell off the gangway, they fell into the water. But uh, if they fell onto the uh, shore uh, of the uh, of the facility, uh, the the end result may not have been as uh, as as it would have been as as they fell into the water. Sort of reminds me of that Japanese uh, TV show, uh, that extreme show. Some of the typical accidents that occur on gangways are slippery walking surfaces, the sudden motion, as I mentioned, of a, of a ship. This could be due to wind or the way the, the vessel has been tied up at, at the dock. Uh, when you have uh, these gangways at a high level, and you not only have passengers using, but crew, it's a good idea to have a safety net underneath the uh, gangway, just in case something uh, unforeseen occurs. And also, uh, gangways need to have handrails, just like any other uh, walking surface uh, that has a change in grade, uh, going from one change of grade to another change in grade. Uh, thank you. you. Okay. okay um, it's all, the presentation is all yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Logan Masuri, and I will uh, pick up the topics as we go along. And the first one is uh, stairs. And the major issue with stairs is, one, some are not designed according to the codes, uh, which, uh, which make it uh, very, uh, very dangerous. Uh, second, uh, they are not consistent in riser, and as a result is the gait of the person going up or down has to change, and uh, it might cause uh, kind of a trip. Uh, the third issue is they have to, wide, to be wide enough in order to accommodate the traffic. Um, if you have a theater or... Or, uh, or a movie, uh, movie place, uh, obviously they have to be wide enough to accommodate everybody. Uh, they have to be inspected uh, because there's wear out on, let's say, the carpet or wear out on the uh, high friction strip that they might install at the tip of the stairs and some others. Handrails are very essential uh, because this will provide stability to anybody who goes up and down the, the stairs. Uh, these are some definitions, so uh, we'll be able to talk about the same thing. Uh, this is the rise. What you see here is the distance between the surface of one stair to the consecutive stair. The thread is the depth of the thread. This is how far you can push your um, uh, shoe into the stairs. Uh, and the nose is this little thing which eventually stick out um, 
below, uh, just uh, maybe an inch or two uh, below the, the front of the stair. Uh, the run is the total length of the stairway, and the rise is the total rise of the stair. Um, you can see here there's a variety of stairs, and each of these have uh, might have a problem. Uh, for example, the one that you see here, uh, the distance between this handrail and the handrail that we might have here is very large, which means it's not it's not accessible to everybody. Just the same is here. Um, this uh, the one on the left is really uh, interesting uh, kind of uh, uh, of a picture. You can imagine if this guy on the top is going to to drop this uh, wheelchair. Eventually, the guy on the bottom will fall all the way down. There are many standards related to stairs, and um, most of them are very similar to each other, and many are eventually quoting or referring to some others. In particular, the state and local building codes are referring to standards either by the government, like, like OSHA or uh, ADA, or the, the fire um, uh, organizations, um, but there are some, uh, some differences, and there are also some differences when it comes to the local, uh, the local code, and therefore uh, you have to consider it when you uh, um, investigate an accident. Um, you can see here this, this cells can be in a very wide range of materials, uh, most of the concerns, obviously, is wood, in particular if it uh, stairs outside and exposed to rain, sun, etc. Uh, concrete is uh, but far more uh, stable than wood. Uh, glass is, has its own other problems. And steel, if it's an outside uh, application, it might be rusty and eventually lose, uh, lose integrity. These are some very fundamental kind of requirements, which I pull out from one of the codes. Um, the only thing you have to remember that th there is some kind of range by which the riser can go, uh, and, and some other uh, restrictions that this is the first thing you want to check, just to make sure that it complies with the, the standard. Other thing that you want to make sure that the maximum rise is 12 feet, after 12 feet, you're supposed to have a landing, so people can eventually stand on more stable kind of a platform before going to the next flight. Um, handrails are required in most cases in both sides, in some cases in one side. It depends on the arrangement, but they are always required. Uh, later on, we'll talk about uh, what the requirements from the handrails themselves but when it comes to stairs, the handrails have to continue um, um, once you are reaching the bottom of the staircase, and they have to start at the, almost at the land, uh, just at the top of the stairs, because the bend in the handrail is giving you a cue that here is the end of the staircase, and you expect to see, you know, a flat, a flat surface. Typical accidents. The first one is uneven stairs, which means you have seven inches, six and a half, seven inches, etc. And what happens is, as you start to step up the stairs, eventually your brain is defining a new gate. And um, after two, three stairs, you don't really think about it, or you don't even look at this, and you expect to see the same rise from one to another. If there is any kind of a change, uh, um, you are being caught by surprise, and you might trip. This becomes even worse when you go down. And in many cases, the last, when you go down a staircase, you, know, you find out because of some uh, measurement mistakes or who knows what, uh, the bottom stair is different from the others. And therefore, when you expect to... Before you expect to hit the floor, eventually you are engaging with the with the floor, and this might cause confusion. Uh, more than this, as you walk down, eventually you have to control the energy that you are gaining by moving down, and this might be difficult to people, and therefore they have to use a handrail in order to do this. 
second problem is that the edge of the skirt is not uh, visible. And uh, you can see this in, um, in facilities like uh, opera houses, etc., because they have a beautiful, uh, let's say, carpet, but you, and if the carpet has some kind of a patterns, it will disturb your vision, and you won't be able to identify where is the edge of, of the stair or where is the next stair. Um, and therefore, in many cases, you want to make sure that the, uh, the nose of the stair is uh, absolutely visual. Uh, if the stair is wet or um, has some kind of a dirt, it becomes to be slippery, and not only you have to engage with going up and down the stairs, you also have to engage with a reduced coefficient of friction, which will cause a problem. Uh, environment, it uh, relates to illumination uh, and any other uh, weather condition. Uh, what you have to do, um, you want to have a clear marking of the nose. You want to make sure that it's easily uh, detected, and you want to have a very high friction of the surface. Carl, it's yours. Thank you, Warren. Uh, the next area we want to talk about are ramps, and those are uh, passageways, pathways, which uh, connect two uh, areas of different at uh, different levels or different, uh, and we want to make sure that the uh, that the slopes are not uh, steep and that the coefficient uh, friction on that ramp is high. And when you have a lot of passenger traffic, one of the concerns is that if it's a concrete uh, ramp, it'll be worn smooth and and thus reducing the coefficient of friction. And it's also important that uh, the ramp not only uh, be of a good surface, but also have handrails uh, to assist in walking up the or down that uh, particular ramp. Uh, most of us are familiar with ramps, and we really never really pay much attention to them. Uh, we use them all the time. Uh, when we are in airports, uh, to get from the terminal to the, to the airplane, we use a ramp. Uh, there it's called the, a jetway or a loading bridge or passenger boarding bridge, or an airport boarding bridge, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as you can see uh, this example right here. And, of course, there are all sorts of other types of ramps uh, that are used to provide accessibility to people with disabilities, to make it easy for them to go from one elevation to the other. There are numerous standards out there, uh, uh, basically uh, the same standard agencies for the other components of the terminals that we've been talking about, also have standards for ramps as well, such as OSHA, ADA, uh, the uh, National Fire Protection Association, of course, all the building codes, the International Building Code, and uh, the codes that are, uh, most of us are familiar with BOCA, but BOCA has been replaced by the International Building Codes, even though the code is not much different, uh, but there's this whole series of codes. And most uh, places in the United States do adopt some form of the international codes for their state and local building codes. This is uh, just a, a depiction of a ramp and uh, shows uh, the typical things that should be in the design, such as uh, a landing at the top and a landing at the bottom to have transition. It's, it's not an easy thing to go uh, uh, from one surface area to another without having an adequate uh, place in which to uh, exit from the ramp or enter from the ramp. The ramp requirements, uh, of course, we talked about handrails, and uh, maximum slope uh, that's recommended by most of the codes is 1 foot uh, to 12 feet, 1 foot rise to 12 feet in length, and uh, if you have people with wheelchairs, it's probably better to have something like 1 foot to 20, 20 feet or a 5% slope. Uh, it makes it easier for uh, a person with a wheelchair to uh, be able to, or with crutches or with uh, cane or senior citizens. Uh, 1 to 12, even though that's listed as a maximum slope, it still could be difficult for some individuals. And of course, as I mentioned before, the landing is important. Uh, some of the uh, safety enhancements that we apply to ramps is to ensure that the surface has a high coefficient of friction so that we don't have falls because of slipperiness and that we know where the beginning of the ramp is and where the end of the ramp is. Okay, my turn. 
Uh, I'll talk just a bit about elevators. Uh, the definition is uh, quite clear. There's a car that goes up and down and serves at least uh, two landings. Uh, it's very rarely two landings, but uh, it probably exists. Um, and we find elevators in different sizes and shapes. Uh, some of them are very uh, decorative, like this one. Some of them are very simple, like the one on the right. Um, they basically the same thing. It's a box connected to cables, uh, which uh, pull them up and let them go down. In cases where you have a very few floors, maybe up to three or four, it might be hydraulic. And what they do, they stick a big piston in the ground, and the piston is telescopic, and it's pushing uh, the car up and down. Uh, again, uh, I'm sure that you noticed by now that all this organization have something to say about elevators, about ramps, about steps, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, it's fundamentally the same source uh, or the same organization which monitor or control uh, the standards for all these uh, devices. The requirements here, uh, there are many requirements, but uh, these are the most important. Uh, obviously, we have to satisfy the ADA, so handicapped people can use it. Uh, you want to have handrails uh, so people can support themselves. Uh, the surface has to be uh, of high friction, so people won't slip. Uh, then uh, you have a full set of controls in order to control the elevator, up, down, open doors, emergency stop, etc. The thing that we have to worry about when it comes to accidents when, with, uh, with people is, is two things. One is the closing doors. And there are very tough requirements on how much energy is of the door when it's, you know, uh, as a trouble. And the second one is what is the maximum force that the, the door can apply to a person who was caught in, bet in between. And the idea here is the force is such that uh, it will not cause any um, any injury. But at the same time, if you think about 30 pound force, it might cause probably it might cause a fall. So you won't be injured by the door itself, but you might be injured from the the fall itself. There is one more thing that I didn't mention here is what are the acceleration and decelerations as you go up and down. But also, what are the decelerations when somebody hits the emergency stop? Because if you decelerate too fast, you lose your balance and you can get hurt. Um, uh, this is our safety issues, which means that uh, if the door, if the elevator is stuck, we're supposed to have to have some kind of a tooling to uh, to open the door and release the people. Uh, emergency uh, exit from the top. I would not recommend anybody to go there unless you feel like James Bond. Um, ventilation is obvious. And the vertical difference, this is another source of problem uh, between the floor of the car and the floor uh, of, of the building cannot exceed 0.5 inches. It's very interesting that we allow 0.5 inches, which is twice as much as we allow on any kind of a walkway uh, surface. In a walkway, we allow only 0.25, but here, as Carl says, this is a, probably some kind of a compromise. Typical uh, accident, uh, door closing so fast, uh, there is a standard for the speed. Uh, too high of a force, uneven floors, as I mentioned a second ago, abrupt starting and stopping, people falling, losing their balance, and there is no handrail in the car. Enhancement. Uh, one simple thing, uh, you probably know every, or most of the cars these days have uh, a voice announcing what is the, the floor you are in or what the floor is coming. Uh, unfortunately, they are not using the same thing to give you some kind of a warning, like uh, you are in the way of the door, please uh, please get in, uh, the door are closing. So there are very, very few of these. Uh, this will be helpful more than just 
um, maybe a light or maybe uh, some kind of a beep. Excuse me, excuse me, Carl and Warren. Uh, to follow, can, we, can we take a question and answer break here? Sure. Excellent. Uh, to follow up on Amanda's question about the revolving door accidents at airports, uh, Amanda specifically is wondering, uh, what are the factors that can contribute to someone falling in a revolving door that is controlled electronically, and are there any um, standards that um, – that, that you can reference uh, for revolving doors. Okay, can I answer this, uh, Carl? Sure, go right ahead. Well, um, there are two, eventually there are two kinds of doors. One door which is a totally passive, which means it rotates once you you push it. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, what happen, might happen is that somebody is pushing this too fast and you cannot catch with him and uh, and you fall. The second problem with this is too many people are getting into one section, and therefore it's very crowded and they uh, entangle with each other and some one of them trip, and this is a problem. The second kind of um, of doors, revolving doors, are um, it's uh, some kind of uh, they have a assistant mechanism. It's not that the door rotates all the time with the same speed and therefore you have to adjust your walking speed to the speed of the door. But the door is usually large and heavy, and they realize that some, some people won't be able to push it. So once you start pushing it, there is a small motor which is engaged and helps you in pushing it. But it will not take over, or not supposed to take over, your rate of walking or the rate that you push it. It just will help you out. If something happened to this particular mechanism, uh, this might be a problem. One, if it's not sensitive to your requirements, it might uh, run the doors by far faster. Or third, it might do just the opposite, which means rather to help you out, it might, you know, um, uh, provide more resistance. And as a result of this, as you push very, very hard, and once you want to disengage, you have, you might trip because all the time you are pushing, pushing against some resistance, and suddenly the resistance disappears. Carl, if you have something to add, this no, is I think you put it very well. There's another question here which you probably could answer as well on uh, doors into supermarkets, the automatic doors that open as you approach. Well, yeah, most these are not these are not revolving usually. No, they, these are <laughs> that, since you being there, and they open. Sorry? I think that the party is referring to the doors in stores where when you come to the doors, there's an electric eye up on the top, and it opens the doors for you as you can. Yeah, yeah but uh, usually supermarkets don't have revolving uh, doors. Revolving doors, by the way, they are very, very expensive. I don't know if you if you know. And that's why you see them in, you know, um, uh, big hotels and this kind of facilities. You won't see them. Uh, even in a, a fancy malls, for example. Well, the original concept of revolving doors is so that the heat or the air conditioning in the building would be retained. Yes. But that was the original so concept for the revolving doors. Yes, I agree. But also, it's very, you know, it's very attractive kind of thing. Okay, we, we have a question here from Stuart who asks um, if you can comment on uh, the rules and regulations for automatic doors utilized to go in and out of supermarkets, department stores, and other department locations. This is separate of, of revolving doors, but um, are, the, are, the, are the rules and regulations the same for the elevator doors that open as to the uh, automatic doors that are utilized in these um, big box stores? They are similar. Because I don't remember exactly the uh, the data, but uh, they are very similar, which means um, uh, there is a maximum kind of a force that they can apply. Uh, they're supposed to have a certain uh, kinetic energy. Um, in this particular case, maybe uh, they have to specify how long they are going to open because they have to allow uh, not just a person, but a person with a cart to move through. But uh, I would uh, I would say that they are very similar to each other, 
and uh, I have to look at the standard to give the, the details. It's, you probably would find those standards in the local building code. Okay, uh, let's proceed with the presentation of content. Carl, I think you're up with uh, escalators. Uh, uh, interesting thing is that when we're going to talk about the escalators, it's very similar to the discussion we had before on stairs. Uh, the types of problems we have with escalators are very similar to stair problems, uh, especially if you choose to walk uh, up or down the escalator as it's moving. Uh, and that's uh, an interesting thing in itself. Here's uh, some examples of escalators. And one bears in mind that the, as we talked about with stairs, it's a, it's, if you're walking, the escalator, as it gets to the, to the bottom or the top, uh, of course it's serving a, a change in elevation, the, the riser of the escalator stair changes. And this can cause a problem if you're walking on it because uh, it changes your gait of walking and if you're not cognizant of this, it could result in a fall. Uh, some of the issues that we have with escalators, uh, if they go too fast, uh, uh, you have to bear in mind that escalators operate, uh, it's like a continuous loop type of thing of stairs, but they are controlled by brakes, and sometimes those brakes uh, that operate to maintain the kinds of speed fails and can cause certain kinds of problems. The design of the escalator has to be such that the uh, the handrail and the stairs moving at the same rate. You can imagine a handrail moving faster than the stairs or slower than the stairs, and your hand constantly having to move to stay in position. Uh, these are some pictures of of, of people's shoes and, and feet getting trapped, and especially if you're going down on an escalator, uh, the stairs behind you are going to constantly push your foot into the gap. There's, there has to be some sort of gap between the edge of the escalator and the stairs because uh, the, the two metal bodies have, have to pass without touching each other. And in some cases where the gap is too excessive, you see these like brush kinds of things at the edge to prevent uh, individuals from getting caught in there. But uh, children seem to figure out how to do it, even with all the precautions that are, are taken in terms of operating escalators. The standards, again, the same... Uh, Organizations. The major standard for escalators is the ANSI ANSI ASME A17 standards. Uh, it's not just 17.1. I think it goes uh, to 17.5, and it's, uh, it's a huge amount of standards in various aspects. And that's the major standard on escalator operation design, maintenance, etc. Uh, here's some of the requirements. Uh, sort of briefly mentioned. Handrails and stairs at the same speed. The entry and exit point should be clear. The dimension should be tight. And the maximum speed should not exceed 100 feet per minute. And there should be signs to caution, you know, individuals uh, to, you know, not to uh, use the uh, handrail or the moving handrail as a m method of transportation. Most of the falls that occur are at entry and exit. And you've got to keep in mind, uh, you're on a staircase that's moving both horizontally and vertically, and some people have this vertigo experience uh, because of the two movements and because of the, the distractions and the views and everything else, and can sometimes uh, lose their balance because of the differentials of height and uh, the change in the height and the uh, horizontal movement. And just like with other modes of of transportation internal terminals, audio warnings are very useful. Uh, you find them sometimes, and, and more times than not, you don't find them. Okay, um, we talked a lot about friction, so we decided to give a little uh, physics class here. Uh, so friction is eventually uh, defined by the interaction between two surfaces in contact while moving one relative to the other. And the simple uh, example here is think about uh, this weight, which is on this cart. Uh, this is a coefficient of friction between the cart surface and the block, this weight surface. There's no friction on the wheels here. And what I do, I'm going to push 
or to pull this weight with the force air. So you can imagine that I can start with a very, very small force. Nothing happens because the friction force here is very high. The cart will move because this friction force will move the cart. So if I'm, um, so I'm going to measure the force that I'm applying by this, um, uh, by this gauge. And at a certain point, as I'm increasing this force, uh, this uh, block will slide over this surface. So if I draw this uh, forces, here it is. I'm increasing the force and increasing the force, and nothing happens. At this particular point, the slide is starting. It's called impending motion. And as a result of this, the friction force drops dramatically, and it's almost remained constant. Um, what we are interested is in this particular point, and this particular point is this the maximum friction force, which is called the static or the Coulomb coefficient of friction. And only for this particular uh, point in the whole process, this relationship is correct, which says that the force or the friction force equal to the coefficient of friction multiplied by W, which in this case will be the normal force to the surface. Okay. Now, um, it depends on U.S., which is the coefficient of friction, depends on many different things. Obviously, uh, the surface materials, uh, you know, you might have a very good uh, rough concrete uh, kind of a surface, but somebody is wearing uh, shoes and the bottom is made out of Teflon. Uh, obviously, the coefficient of friction between these two uh, surfaces will be very low. Uh, surface condition. Uh, it means if it's dirty, if it's wet, etc. Uh, sometimes you see texture. We are trying to put some texture to the surface in order to uh, increase the traction. And if there is any kind of interaction between the material of this particular um, um, this particular surface, uh, you think about it that you step on on a super glue and you walk uh, on the surface. If you don't walk in, you know, fast enough, you probably adhere to the surface, but otherwise, uh, you are going to have very high resistance. Uh, what are the minimum requirements? The minimum requirement is the coefficient of friction will be uh, 0.5. Uh, I just want to mention that coefficient of friction is dimensionless. Uh, I found many experts who gave some dimensions the coefficient of friction, and obviously they they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, this is not a standard. This is something which is mentioned in some standards, but um, it's agreed by uh, many different organizations. In any case, a, uh, the American Disability Act, they want to increase this value uh, to 0.6, in particular for those surfaces uh, where a uh, handicap has to be using, like ramps, um, and they want to avoid uh, uh, any kind of, uh, of a slip. These are the different standards. I won't repeat myself five times. Here it is. Uh, what are the accidents? The accidents are low coefficient of friction, which is inherent to the material that you are using. For example, uh, we talk about uh, metal, metal stairs. The coefficient of friction on metal is usually low, and uh, you find a lot of slip and fall there. Uh, surface contamination, if you have a very good surface, but somebody uh, contaminate this with, let's with the sand, if you look at each particle of the sand, it's like a little ball, so eventually you are rolling on the surface rather than um, making good contact with it. And uh, obviously, if it's a wet or dry um, uh, surface. The other thing which is very important from a human point of view is a sudden transition from high to low coefficient friction. And this accident happens all the time. One example is obviously in the north. Um, you are at home, and you are living home, and outside it's ice, icy. Um, the difference between the coefficient of friction at home, which is the carpet or, uh, you know, dry uh, wood floor, and the ice is very, very high. And most of the accidents happen in the first step. 
what happened later, if you manage to negotiate the first and the second step, your brain, as we mentioned before, is eventually adjust your gate to the new coefficient of friction. Now, this happens in the north all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm talking from Florida, so we don't have ice, but we do, we do have a lot of swimming pools. And some of the administrators uh, wanted to have a very nice uh, swimming pool. And what they do, they paint three feet, let's say, of, of a strip all around the swimming pool. And this strip is, is not uh, absorbing water like, let's say, the concrete on the rest of the surface. And the guy is walking from into the swimming pool, and he walks on the concrete, which is the high coefficient of friction. And his first step on the painted surface is exactly where he's going to form. So the transition is a, prob a major problem when it comes to uh, coefficient of friction. Um, there are many different measurements. Uh, there are many, there are few standards. This is the most common one, which means this is the surface that we are um, uh, examining. Uh, we have a plate here under this. This is a nail light. This is a certain material. Uh, we put a weight of 50 pounds just to make sure that the contact is very good contact. And we are pulling and measuring what is the force, what is the maximum force needed to start uh, the impending motion. And you estimate the coefficient of friction by this force divided by the weight, which is the 50 pounds plus the weight of, of this uh, little fixture. Uh, you have uh, different machines. Uh, I just go through them because uh, some of you maybe saw it. Uh, this is called the, the British Pendulum. And what it does, uh, it has um, uh, some kind of arrangement here where you put the material. And as you drop it, it will slide on the surface here. And you are going to measure here uh, eventually how much energy was absorbed. And you can translate this to the coefficient of friction. Uh, this is a James machine, but this is only good for lab environment. Uh, you can imagine we cannot take this to the street. Uh, there is um, a standard which calls uh, English Excel, and this is something that you have to worry about it because uh, because this is very impressive. It's very impressive when the guy comes to to court and he can bring this with him and demonstrate how this can be used. And there is a small uh, pressure container here, and he pushing. Uh, you know, it's a nice, very nice show, I would say this. But this standard was dismissed by ASTM because the measurements have a very, very poor repeatability. You are running 10 experiments on the same surface. You find deviation of 20%. So uh, I put it there just to make sure that you know about it. There are some others. Um, many standards coming from ASTM. I uh, member on this committee, so uh, I have the opportunity to show some uh, some of these uh, devices. And you can see a lot of different devices. Uh, some of them expensive, some of them are cheap. Um, uh, you just want to make sure that uh, they comply with at least one of the standards. Uh, there are also processes, how to measure, how to uh, report, etc. You have to pick up the relevant standard. There are standards to measure coefficient of friction between tires and the road, between uh, shoes and the tile, etc., etc. So the expert has to, has to understand that he has to pick up the relevant one. Um, what are the difficulties? The first difficulty which you, are, which you are being, or me, or somebody else being attacked all the time, is when you measure coefficient of friction with, in wet conditions. It's uh, very intuitive that in wet conditions, the coefficient of friction will be lower than in dry condition on the same surface, because the water is uh, serving like as a lubricant. But what happened is a phenomenon which calls friction. And what this section does is once you apply this very, very high, very high force on between the two surfaces, a very uh, thin layer of, uh, of liquid is being captured, 
and the forces, the molecular forces between the, this uh, uh, liquid and both surfaces causing an apparent coefficient of friction which is higher. So you have to, you have to worry about this a little bit and the expert's supposed to do something for you. There are many local factors that affect like, uh, um, a surface is worn out in one, one place, the surface is tainted in another place, etc. Uh, surface was treated after the event. Uh, you go to the supermarket, there was sick, sleep and fall, it was uh, two months ago. Uh, you go there and eventually they already wax the, the floor and um, my reading or any other expert reading uh, totally irrelevant. Um, and therefore, uh, if you have any case, you have to, uh, to make the measurements as soon as possible. Um, then uh, you do some experiments and you get some deviation. There is no standard how to deal with the statistical treatment of the results. Um, something that we have to think about it. Uh, Carl and Oren, we're right at 3 o'clock and we have a couple questions uh, in the queue. So can we address the questions and then maybe wrap up the presentation? Sure. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, two questions here. Uh, the first one comes from Robert who asks, at some cruise ship passengers terminals, the ship's steel gangway becomes wet from the rain and often no rubber matting or other slip resistance is employed. Are there any specific standards to reducing the type of risk associated with slip and falls on wet steel gangways or ramps? Well, there are. We showed in the in the presentation that there's a whole series of standards out there. It's just like any walkway or any other surface where people are walking. It's, those standards apply to a gangway. Gangway is just a type, but the the standards are universal. Okay, excellent. We have a question here from Roderick who asks. So the escalator movement and the, and the vertigo effect, is this a commonly known phenomenon? Is there any duty on behalf of the escalator company or the premises owner to post a caution sign with that regard? It's, it, it happens. It's not a common thing. It happens. Uh, it happens to people who are, you know, have a fear of heights. or You have to bear in mind that an escalator is used to go between two different levels, like an escalator, an elevator. And you're moving, in the case of an elevator, you're moving in one direction. In the case of an escalator, you're moving in two. And it really depends upon the environment. Are you in a narrow environment or are you in a big shopping mall? Uh, you know, th these all come into play. But yeah, there's one more issue with the come to escalator, is if you have uh, a power failure. If you have the power failure, the escalator eventually stops abruptly. And therefore, you have acceleration acting on the guy. And uh, if you are in your way down, there's a good chance that you are going to um, to fall forward. Or and if you go up, it depends on the direction. So when they stop the escalator, even in, as an emergency case, they have to control the uh, deceleration of the escalators. Otherwise, people might fall. The other thing to keep in mind in a fall on an escalator is not like a stair. A stair may be carpeted, but an escalator has what we call cone plates, you know, and they're very sharp edges. So if you fall on an escalator, you're definitely going to have some kind of bruise or injury. Yeah. Okay, excellent. I don't see any other questions in the queue. Uh, Oren and Carl, do you have any concluding remarks that you would like to make? Well, uh, I think that everyone could, you know, see the other things we didn't cover are the moving walkways and handrails, and it's pretty self-explanatory in the presentation. But one thing to keep in mind, uh, which is very important in this area, is when you get the expert involved. And it's uh, something that you want to do in the beginning of a case and not at the end of the case, because uh, experts can help you with checklists and help you determine causations, damages, uh, decisions, uh, whether to proceed, discovery, duty of care, elements of liability, the preservation of evidence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is something that we don't stress enough in our presentations, how important it is to get the expert involved early on, and that's three weeks before the trial is about to begin. Okay. Uh, with that, I'll just very briefly wrap up uh, the presentation. First, 
on behalf of everybody, I'd like to thank Carl and Warren for the time that they took uh, putting this presentation together. I think it, it, it contains a wealth of information, and there's a lot of uh, reference material in here. And we will be sending out a copy of the uh, of the present of the PowerPoint presentation, so that each of you will have all of those standards at your disposal. If you'd like to speak to Carl or Warren about a specific case or project that you are working on. You can contact us here at PASA. Our telephone number is 800-523-2319. And as I, as I mentioned, we'll be sending out a link to the archived recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. Uh, in that email, there'll be a link to the, to the PowerPoint presentation that was used during today's program. Um, all of PASA's previous webinars can be found on our website. Visit pasanet.com and in the top level navigation, click on Knowledge Center and you'll be given an option to view all of the webinars. Um, they're, they're free to view the archived recordings, and they play right on your computer. Um, our next webinar for legal professionals pre preparing the construction accident case will take place on Tuesday, April 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. They should have received an invitation for that program uh, today. If you did not receive an invitation and would like one, uh, please send me an email and I will get it to you uh, as soon as possible. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, we do take all of your comments under consideration, and they help us to produce better programs. Uh, please send me an email at mhide at uh, With that, I will end today's meeting, and thank you for uh, spending an hour with me. Thank you so much.